Hello, hello. Welcome to the Pure and Heart Show, where we discuss all things theology of the body related. I'm Harry, and I'm joined today by Home of the Mothers, Father Luke Damasi, to talk about the crisis of masculinity we, we face today. Uh, what is it? What are the causes? What can we do about it? Uh, but before we get into the show, I want to remind listeners to check out our previous shows in podcast form. Just go to Google, type in Radio Maria, Pure and Heart Show. The first result should take you right to them. Um, so uh, more and more of our episodes are being streamed uh, on YouTube and on Facebook Live as well, including this one. So wherever you're listening from uh, or watching from, you're most welcome. And do share the show with your friends and family, like and subscribe and all that jazz. Uh, if at any point you wish to make a comment or ask a question to Father Luke during today's show, we would love to hear from you. 089-467-2000 is our text and WhatsApp number. So have at it. That's 089-467-2000. Father Luke, welcome to the show. Thanks, Harry. Appreciate it. Good to hear. Good to see you here. Listen, so well, I got to say, it's great to have you on. Uh, I've had this show in my mind for a long time, and I've been looking forward uh, to having you on. So, uh, why don't you tell listeners a little bit about yourself to start? You know, where you're based, what you do, your YouTube channel, whatever you like. So, I'm Father Luke Damasi. I'm originally from New Hampshire. It's the Northeast United States, and I've been with the home of the mother for 15 years now. I joined when I was 22. Yeah, so that's 14 years, sorry, 36 years old. And I've been here in Ireland for four years now. We're in Mallow, so it's the Diocese of Cloyne. And the bishop, uh, Bishop William Crean, asked us to come in four years ago, basically just to go through all the secondary schools, giving testimony, retreats, and talks, and just loads of other things. So it's been going really good for four years, thanks be to God. And uh, we had, a, yeah, we had a, a channel kind of get up and going during lockdown. Uh, it's called fireside with fathers is like a like a show that we do um the channel is called servants hm films but um yeah it's just something kind of like an initiative that we started because we we do see like an importance working with with uh media and just kind of trying to evangelize that that aspect of our our generation so yeah that's basically it amazing it's good work really really important stuff i mean evangelizing schools is similar to what we do in in during heart going around talking in schools and universities about these kind of things and what kind of things would you talk about in the schools what, what would be the approach you take so if it's a first time um it's basically a testimony um there's four brothers here in the community two priests and two brothers so father renee is the other priest that's with us he's like a semi-professional juggler so that's also like a really important aspect of <laughs> just like it's it's unbelievable like what he can do <laughs> And so that's usually like something that's that's there. And then like um, as far as content, if it's a first time, it will be like a testimony. So just give our stories. And uh, across the board, it's like really relative to the I mean, secondary school level. They understand like the stuff we're talking about, if it's drugs or um, parties or just like what an adolescent would be kind of like either tempted with or getting into. And the fact that we're priests, like we were in there, we got out of it and we're basically showing them you know, that there is something there. So it's, it's been huge because it's, it's a lot of hope that, that comes with it as well. Cause these boys would just have, you know, it's either just sports or like social media, really. There's not, their horizon is not very, uh, yeah. let's say hopeful. So like, it is just like an injection there of, of something new. And it also at the same time is giving a good image back to the priests. So like mm. a lot of negativity out there on priests in this country. Sure, so it's something yeah. that's also like a side note, like it's, it's also like a good image too. Yeah, for sure. No, it's really, really amazing stuff. The definitely the testimonies are always what really get people, you know, because it's so relatable. And I've heard you have an amazing testimony. Maybe we'll hear it out of you in a subsequent show, but uh, I'm sure it works really well. I think I saw the juggling priest again. What's his name again? Father Rene. Father, Father Rene. Rene. I think I saw yeah. him at a U2000 retreat once. Blew my mind. As long as it, well, as well as everybody else's, I'm sure. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the crisis of masculinity, uh, where we're clearly, you know, we're clearly facing a crisis of masculinity in today's world. Uh, one term that keeps cropping up is toxic masculinity. Uh, is this an appropriate term for the phenomenon or can it be misleading? Well, toxic, when I think of toxic, I think of like poisonous. Um, so sin is a poison, like we, we bit the apple and we were poisoned. Um, so whenever we indulge um and engage with the enemy we're we're going to be poisoned because he's at the end of the day he's a serpent and he's venomous and like he's going to he's going to bite us so like our three enemies would be the devil um he's the great enemy he's he always is the opposite of god so god is i am who am the devil would be i am who am not so he's just he would like to kind of prefer to be like you know behind the scenes and hidden 
and let the other enemies take over. So like the enemies that we're more used to would be our flesh and the world. So those are the, the three classic enemies of the soul, the world, the devil, and the flesh. And as men, like when we lose sight that we're actually in a battle and we stop fighting, we enter into this engagement with the enemies and they just were cannon fodder. Like it's just, we're done. Mm. So like, I mean, toxic masculinity, like a poisoned masculinity, I can see like mm. why you would see that. Um, I think we're used to seeing kind of like two aspects of it. Like I was just thinking about it. Um, you have like the macho man, uh, you know, mm. like the, the, the dude, like he's just ripped and he's like, he's a man. Like he gets laid, he gets all the girls. It's just mm. like, this guy is, this is the man, you know, you put him up as like the, the model, like of a man, uh, that would be like a, an extreme. I would say this toxic masculinity of like this macho man. I, I lived a lot of that in, um, in Ecuador. I did missions there and we had one province that for me, it just broke my heart with the lads. Like we'd have a summer camp with these boys and you just find out like their basically their home situation. Like the majority of them wouldn't have a father because the father just bounces around. He goes from one to another and he leaves like little pods behind you know like mom and kid and um a custom that they had in one of these areas was on the boy's 14th birthday his dad would bring him to a brothel and he would lose his virginity so like that was the initi initiation into this manliness into this manhood um mm -hmm. and like for me it was heartbreaking because you would get these boys like uh when you get them early like you know it's there's something you can do but like it's just this cycle that continues of like this idea of that's what it means to be a man and they mirror more like like donkeys really than than men because it's just like yeah. this this muscular strong like beastly thing that just like you know he puts his his mm -hmm. his masculinity on on like how strong he is and like how many girls he gets and then another aspect I'd say of this toxic or this venomous masculinity that's been injured by, by so many things is like an effeminacy. So I've seen it. I was, I was talking to some, some lads here the other day and I couldn't believe that one of the guys actually did shave his legs. Like for me, that was a, a phenomenon that I, I just didn't like, I had friends that were swimmers. So I was like, all right, you're a swimmer and it's something that you do. Uh, I had a buddy who also, he did it. I mean, just for like to run fast or whatever, but like the guy I was talking to the other day, he says it's something that's getting more and more common because it's just like, it looks cleaner and nicer. And I was like, man, like if I, like myself in high school, if, if one of the guys shaved his leg, it just wasn't even <laughs> think about like, like he it's wouldn't right, do that. Right. Like that's what effeminacy means. Like women traits in a man, effeminacy in women's also not good either. Uh, Aquinas says it's like this, this desire and like this, this just like a craving for pleasures. That's just another aspect of it. We'll get more into that. But like this idea right. of just losing your identity as a man and becoming more, you know, a feminine, more feminine is another spectrum that we're seeing, like the extreme. So like mm. toxic masculinity, it's there. Um, um, like I said, you can see it in extremes. You could go on and on and on. Um, I think it's just society, if it, like people who are listening, I think they can relate this and they can put their finger on like, you know, different men in their lives that they're going to see that this is happening. But um, the, yeah, the answer is, is, is manliness in this true form, which is virtue. Mm -hmm. Virtue is, is, it literally means strength, manliness. It comes from veer from the Latin, which is, is like manliness. That's what we get the word manliness. So it's like, uh, it's, you know, these, you have these extremes, we have to get back into the middle because like, I'm not, I'm not, also, I'm not saying that like, you know, we do have to be strong as men and we do have to be tender. So like, we do have to have feminine virtues and work towards feminine virtues as men, because they don't come to us naturally, just like women have to work on masculine virtues as well to become like, mm. you know, stronger and less dependent on their emotions and, and affections so i mean it's it's all it's all about virtue so mm. but that's what i would say about toxic masculinity i don't know yeah i was sort of it's kind of like um sort of misguided or misled good fundamentally good originally good i would say drives that men have like a drive to be to be respected or a drive to be um to be competent or a drive to be strong or, or something like this these are sort of good things that god might have created but then they become corrupted i suppose and then just manifest in the most horrible ways um would you would you agree with that or is it sort of yeah a little bit more no it's like it's like everything like we are 
we are good and we are created good if we were if we were to believe otherwise we would just, that would i mean luther was that would be falling into like like protestantism that we're like really just corrupted nasty and there's no remedy that's why grace mm. hides us in the eyes of god and covers us with this like white blanket mm. like no we are sanctification we are, exactly yeah no we're created in his image and in his likeness um the image never will leave us it's the church fathers usually say that it's the likeness that that like it gets you know under so much muck it's like this likeness of god um, the image is something that's always there and then it's like this likeness like i said through sin and through a misguided yeah that's what usually like like is going to be affected but uh no it's it's we are good and like you do see the tendencies like um a good tendency is just taken down the wrong way it's it, it's really just about reclaiming it and uh and re reguiding it through but through grace and virtue like this is mm. this is gonna have to be if we're gonna be talking about manliness and we're gonna be talking about men you can't talk about this conversation without bringing in virtue and you can't talk about virtue without jesus christ because like the stoics the early greeks practiced virtue like they were they were on yeah. top of themselves and they were very virtuous but we're not we're not aiming at that like the secular world also is seeing the beauty of virtue and how important it is uh, jordan peterson's a huge promoter of, of being virtuous making decisions you know making your damn bed as he's like you For know sure. yeah, yeah. Thing, so it's like that's there but like we have to put christ into this because it's it's not mm -hmm. just about like okay i'm going to start becoming on top of myself in order and i'm going to do this mm -hmm. it, it's virtue that comes from from a relationship with jesus christ so like that's going to have to come up like a personal relationship with christ naturally well hopefully we'll get really into that today now so if we're talking about challenges to men what are the greatest challenges facing young catholic men in 2022 well i think the first initial thing that everybody's gonna think about right now um first challenge is is pornography and mm. i think that's something that like you're never gonna you can never get around that and if that's not being spoken about or talking about um there's a big problem mm. uh, i've I have been pulled aside speaking about that, um, you know, but I don't, I just think people are naive, like, oh, gosh, you can't be, you can't, you know, second years, they can't be hearing that, you know, about pornography It's like, look, ever since we have the smartphone, like, it, you know, parents are giving this thing to these kids at this age, yeah. you, you, you can't tell me that this is not an option if over 80% mm -hmm. of, of the internet is just plagued with it. And um, mm. it's just so easy and accessible. So like, that's the first thing that people would think about, which I'm, totally agree with but like for me what i would see right now is the biggest challenge and this is really practical um and i think that's why it's so helpful because like at the end of the day like these conversations are to like get these practical things that i can do to change like i don't i mean you can talk about the situation and tell stories all day long but like yeah if we're not you know given like practical remedies like i don't know they just need to walk away with something so yeah it's for me, uh, the big <clears throat> challenge is the smartphone like mm this uh people are saying like all right like don't say this is the hardest generation we ever lived in because we've had them um i mean but like the argument that that we're dealing with technology on the level that we're dealing with it now is something that we've never ever experienced or seen so like the fact that these compulsive um disorders are coming up with men and they're becoming enslaved and entrapped and their their brains are literally forming like like their neurotic pathways that can't be changed through addiction to the phone. It's like, I, as a priest, I can't talk to you about a relationship with Jesus Christ, about virtue. If I have the smartphone mm -hmm. in, in between, because it's like the, the phone, if we're not dominating this thing right here, it's like, like you can't, you can't start. So like I, when I hear like okay. the challenges though, like the, what's the biggest challenge? I first think of the phone. So we have to go at the phone hard, um, examine well, your, your screen time like what your screen time is um are you addicted to it like is the first yeah. thing you do when you get in the morning you check it before you even go to the bathroom like that's a big one they say like if you're looking at your phone before you even go to the bathroom it's a clear sign you have a problem so father we were talking about practicing virtue we we're talking about the problem of pornography and maybe starting with smartphones i think so harry like i mean just to kind of nip it in the bud you know like if you're just like peeling the the plants off, uh, sorry, the the leaves off the uh, the weed. It's good. Like you can, you know, mm. you're making it smaller, but like really take it out from the roots. So I mean, I'm seeing a lot of times like with these young guys, 
you know, if you go down to the source of it, it is coming down to an addiction to the phone. And then from there, a lot of other things and pornography is the number one addiction there. Um, but there's a lot of other things. So like, what can we do with the phone? Um, some boys have actually had them take up a challenge that we, we like kind of, we just threw out a challenge there to see if they could change their phone for a Nokia or a Nokia, as you guys say, mm -hmm. uh, I've had two lads do that. Um, I've been a priest for like, yeah, for four years. And in those four years, I just two like that. I know of that I've done it seriously, two of them. So it's, it's something that is very hard and mm. that I haven't had like a lot of boys do it, but I'm not going to tire and just, and, and challenge them on that, especially if it's coming to an addiction um, to pornography, like to the hand in the phone for another one. So like that's that right. There's one uh, people can be listening. They can examine their conscience if they would take that challenge. I know Matt Fred on Pints with Aquinas did a show on swapping in for a, a dumb phone. Mm. If you watch that like watch that he answers all the questions and objections that you'd have um and then from there like the next thing would be to all right well look if you're if you're a student and you're in school it's in your bag technically that's where it's supposed to be you're not supposed to have it out uh, when you're home studying it's not in the same room where you're studying in it's not in your your bedroom before you go to sleep it's somewhere else you're never having it in the bathroom you know there's things where you have to start taking steps to separate yourself from it um, you can't just stop doing something either. So I can't just, you know, expect people to just to leave their phone and give it up, especially because it is so addicting. Uh, you have to, as Fulton Sheen says, um, when you have the presence of evil or something that's kind of dominating you, you can't just kick him out. You have to drive him out with an expelling love that's more powerful. So what does that mean? That means at the bottom line, that is entering into a relationship with Christ, which we'll get to that. That has to be the explosive power because we're gonna at the end of the day, we're gonna find out that we can't do this on our own. We need him. Mm -hmm. But practically speaking, you have to fill yourself up with other things. So you can't just leave a void. Um, that's where a musical instrument can come in. Mm -hmm. uh, a hobby um, exercise is fundamental for the lads. Mm -hmm. There has to be some kind of exercise in there. We need it. Um, we just need it. Like it in way, shape or form. Like, I don't care, but like exercise has to be in there. So like all these things are like, these are ideas and like practical steps to start getting rid of something that's owning you and to begin a path of mm -hmm. virtue. So like a challenge, I really do see the phone. Um, and with that is pornography. Um, I know you guys have talked a lot about that uh, and it needs to be, thanks be to God. And then amusements, you know, this whole phenomenon of, of amusements is something I'm starting to get a bit more into, um, yeah. just trying to like get to the bottom of that. Uh, we, we crave distraction, like, you know, we need it and then we love, we love it. It's just something that we, we crave. And when the distractions are so good, that's also, that becomes a problem. Um, mm -hmm. The word mm -hmm. amusement means like, um, a, like anti muse and the muse was what the Greeks would, you know, they would invoke before they'd write a piece of poetry or something. They'd invoke the muse to get inspiration. So like the idea of muse is inspiration, reflection, deep thought, like all these words that we're seeing, like come out of our vocabulary because of the screen time. And so the studies have done on that is unbelievable. Um, our capacity for deep thought and deep thinking has just gone way down because like mm -hmm. our imagination is, is starting to falter because we're getting images given to us so fast constantly for so long that it's hard for our brain to come up with images now like imagining because we're mm. supposed to receive them but anyways that's a whole other even more of a problem with with these short videos these days like reels and instagram and tiktok and like it, youtube shorts it's just like training yourself quick dopamine hits really quick six second videos you know started with kind of yeah. vines a few years ago but i think it's even worse now it's really shortening people's attention spans yeah yeah no it was 2021 we had a seven hour average screen time uh, those oh in the gosh. states, the set, the seven hours, and that was like like going down because like, I, I mean, five hours on TikTok is if you go across the board, secondary schools, girls and boys. Um, once they start, they're just you know five hours easy because you so don't even know what time it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but this whole idea of amusing myself, like cutting <laughs> myself off from, you know, a reflective or like you know, like this 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 part of me where it needs to kind of like stop and think. That's a problem. We see it usually in sports and guys, sports are great, necessary, love them, um, totally for them. But like, you know, we're starting to um, become too amused and get too much into amusements. And it is pulling us away from reflection and 
and and our manliness because that's that's like what separates us from animals like we mentioned before this macho man you know like this guy who's just really hard to find a difference between him and, and a dog you know like he mm. he reproduces uh he eats and he likes he works on his body you know like so well what separates you from your dog it is your rational capacity you know like your intellect mm -hmm. that's what makes you a human being you know you have an intellect so if the intellect's not getting fed and worked you are slowly just becoming more savage in your humanity in the sense that you're just like on an animalistic level of impulses, whims, and instincts. And the intellect is also becoming turned off because you're amusing yourself uh, constantly with, with sports or entertainment. And like, who's going to deny that? Like, have we ever had, you know, our entertainment right now, it's just, it's, it's through the roof. Like, you know, like we just, we're, we have like, the sports are just getting more and more, you know, like crazy and just like, so it's all out there. And uh, it's something that we need to talk about and see like, how can we wean off of that? And how can there be a balance in there? Like there is an extreme there of amusements and that's all part of um, taking away from our, our, our masculinity really, because we're just, we're, we're, we're fleeing from the intellect and from this deep thought and, and mm -hmm. reflection. So you, you were talking yesterday when I, when I spoke to you about the idea of these three S's. So preparation, silence, um, silence, and I can't remember which one is silence. Yeah, else. no, I'm sorry. I, look, the three S's would have been, yeah, silence, solitude, and slow down. Right. But um, okay. I mean, I guess you could put them into one S. Like silence would be the S. Uh, right. <laughs> would be yeah, the big yeah. S word. Um, preparation is extremely important um, for everything, our spiritual life. Uh, talking about manliness, virtue, a lot of this stuff is in the preparation, which means it's like on our end, there's a lot that we have to do. We're not uh, Pelagian. Like a Pelagian would say, like, I have this goal. I want it. I want to be a man. I want to be virtuous. I'm going at it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to put down what I have to put down, and I'm going to get it. I'm going to grab it. That's a danger, especially for us men, because we do see something good, and we want to get it. So we put ourselves in charge. So it's not all about us. Thanks be mm -hmm. to God. Mm. We do have our part though. God created us without us, but he's not going to save us without us. That's something Augustine would always mm. say. And Augustine was very against the Pelagian idea. Like grace is extremely important. So mm -hmm. we put down our part and God puts his grace in. So what's our part? It would be the preparation. You know, a lot of this is preparation. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of like the, you know, like, you have to foresee things. So like people are like, Oh yeah, like I've got this porn addiction or like, you know, I, I can't, I can't pursue girls. I can't talk to them. I'm like really uncomfortable. Like they have all these problems that like bog them down. And so like, all right, well, let's take a step back and let's foresee the whole situation. So like, when are you falling into the occasion? Uh, is it in the shower? Is it in bed? Is it when you're stressed out for an exam, when you're tired? Um, you know, there's all these factors that each person, if you're talking to them individually, know their moment. So like, look, let's foresee it and let's, let's prepare before you fall. All right. So we're going to avoid the occasion. This is huge. Like avoid mm -hmm. the near occasion of sin. That's a huge part of this battle. And that's something that you have to put down. Like mm -hmm. God saved me, like to heal me from this addiction. I don't hear God. Like he doesn't help me. Well, he's, he is helping you because, you know, you're supposed to be putting in your part and not going near what you know is going to hurt you. So, like, mm -hmm. as far as um, avoiding the near occasion of sin, preparing, foreseeing the problem, uh, maybe you're lazy, you don't get out of bed, you keep hitting the snooze. Well, mm -hmm. how are you going to prepare for that? Well, you're going to put your phone across the room and it's like far away from you. You're going to hear your alarm mm -hmm. and you have to get out of bed to go and turn it off. And it's like these things and it's like like if you're talking to someone one-on-one -on -one, it's easier because you can hear like their specific problems but like there is a huge part on our end that we do have to prepare for this and we have to know mm -hmm. like how to put these things down and silence is so crucial yeah. um silence like silence solitude slow down i think you can put them all in the one because like if you have silence you're gonna have solitude and you're gonna slow down so silence um is exterior and interior uh, there's a lot of interior noise going on. We're not capable of praying. If you're not capable of praying, it's game over. Like we said before, mm -hmm. we're in a we're in a battle, and a lot of us don't even realize we're in a battle. And this battle is won through prayer, which prayer mm -hmm. is not just asking God for things. Like a lot of people become mm -hmm. very religious, especially now. Leaving starts coming up. You know, like the boys would go in and light a candle, 
like lot, they'll go into the church light a candle like no problem right now and they're like extremely fervorous on their knees praying because mm. like they got the leaving cert 9 11 you know a disaster happens everybody was in the church just for two months covid people started like praying so look that's there it's right that's fine like this is the firefighter god you know there's a fire we call on him he comes puts it out mm -hmm. and then he's gone but like it's not just asking that prayer is also like an, an intimate relationship with a person and that means you're by yourself you're you're, you're the, the phone's not even near you when you're in prayer it shouldn't be mm -hmm. you shouldn't use your phone to pray either I, i'd like help people out there like to get the scripture in the magnificat form instead of on your phone really just making practical steps to just get it out of there for even you mm. know like these things have yeah to i mean happen. even even if you're reading like scripture on your phone you're getting notifications the whole time your mind's going I know. somewhere else it's like i know like i've i had that in the beginning i was like yeah but like oh, but then but now i'm getting more and more convinced lads we need to w this generation is so hard but that's why we have to make we have to fight back and we mm. can't compromise in a lot of things like i said it's new there's things here that we haven't experienced before so we do have to fight back hard but silence is so crucial because silence is the soil where the seed of prayer is planted. And that's where the preparation comes in. We have to clean out the field, the interior noise, and set down a time every single day where I'm alone. If you're before the Blessed Sacrament, 100% the best. If you can't, well, you're in a room mm -hmm. where you know no one's going to bother you in front of a crucifix. And you're starting to enter into the battle. This is, this is the battle for... Mm -hmm prayer israel means he who fights with god you're fighting to get god in that center and to start with him there and that's going to bring you into solitude and that's going to slow you mm. down we're an extremely fast-paced society where it's just mm. like we're accelerating constantly we don't know how to assimilate what we've lived so yeah. it's just like you go from one thing to another there's no assimilation so without assimilation there's no growth it's just fast 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 one thing after the other and there's mm. no like solid stopping and like assembling what i really need to be assimilating so mm. like silence and prayer which is like solitude yeah with god slows mm. you down and then from there we can start so this is extremely important we have to put mm. down um we have to like look at our, our lifestyle and say like where is my time of prayer and what's my quality of prayer because if you can tell me your capacity for silence i could easily tell you your what kind of man you are because it's like mm. they go one and one like hand in hand silence and manliness is just like it's mm. it's everything really i have a beautiful quote here by saint john vianney prayer is to our soul what rain is to the soil it fertilizes the soil the soil ever so richly it will remain barren unless fed by frequent rains and i think really in this life like certainly in 21st century life 2022 you're swimming against this massive current you have to be really forceful in making that space for yourself if i had a euro for the number of times i'd heard my friends saying i wish i could just throw my phone out the window you know i mean we're craving for it it's something that we're all our hearts are all craving for i think because there's just so much noise as you say we can't even think we can't make plans for our own lives we can't have a relationship with god we can't even have relationships often with our own families you know i mean uh, the number of times you see a family sitting around the dinner table together each one of them with their phones out you know it's it's um yeah so father something that occurred to me um would you recommend fasting as well totally yeah i mean when we're talking about solutions we forgot to mention the exodus 90 like that whole phenomenon uh, this year in ireland we had 300 Mm. lads doing it i think that was over 40 groups about 40 groups which is, is really taken off i mean the pillars yeah, of exodus 90 for me yeah it's just like we're this whole thing about amusement we we're talking about you know cutting that out um making sacrifices so when i fast and i'm not eating in between meals um the or taking a cold shower like the cold shower is it's not really just to be like oh man i'm gonna take a cold shower and do something hard like it's like the idea is you want to take a warm shower everybody mm. wants a warm shower everybody wants to have a snack when you've got the munchies it's like you want that so like the idea of not doing that is you're saying no to your will when the will is used to receiving a yes he's like this bratty little child within you that you know <laughs> you go to the you go to the the supermarket and he's screaming because he wants like the candies you know how it's like they put them at eye level like in the checkout counter exactly, yeah. for a reason obviously and it's like it's, it's very hard to get him to be quiet but you slowly slowly get used to saying no and it's going to get to the point where you walk him through the aisle and it doesn't even 
you know, or it's a lot, at least it's not as hard to, you know, for like the, the little baby inside you is not going to be screaming. So like the idea is, is that every time you say no to your will, instead of saying yes, this is going back to the enemy of the flesh because our flesh is always looking for our flesh just means basically like our carnal desires to, to rest eating sex, like these cardinal desires that we have in us. If, if the, if the, the flesh is not used to hearing, you know, if it's always used to hearing a yes, it's going to dominate us. So a cold shower fasting, those are violent moments where you're killing this carnal desire which is your enemy and you're at a very specific moment saying no and on the other end it's making your will stronger we have very flabby wills like the will is very flabby and overweight uh, because it's so used to getting what it wants all the time so when it comes time for me to make an important decision or do something hard my will is flabby you can't lift five kilos Whereas if I was doing this in moments of my day, in little moments, making your bed, you know, you turn on the cold water instead of the hot, <laughs> you know, you, you, you said no for the snack, which by the way, this goes back to the foreseeing, like you don't just get into the shower and turn on the cold water. Nobody does that. There's a preparation before where you've had a moment and you've made the decision and you've said your prayer and you go into it. You just walk into the shower and then turn on the cold water automatically. I mean, some lads can. Or you don't just see you don't just see the Jaffa cakes and say like oh no like there's a preparation before where you had yeah. it you know you said no but look these fasting elements are elements of first of all killing the flesh and making the will stronger so that when I have to make a real big decision the will is already a bit jacked he's already had these exercises of mm-hmm. hearing no and he's able and he's able to work so that's very it is a very important aspect and that's why exodus 90 i think it is part of the element along with prayer and brotherhood which um for 90 days is you know that's what it takes really for to get an addiction out of there i thought i recommend it yeah definitely i would be be a supporter of that mm-hmm. kind of reminds me of like if you're in a, a battle zone if you're a soldier like you got to stay in shape you know because you're guaranteed to encounter situations where you're gonna have to run like hell you know um yeah. It's keeping yourself trained, I suppose, in a way. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, So something else that occurred to me. um, So I've heard many Catholic women complaining that Catholic men don't pursue them. Uh, Taking a little direction uh, change here. Uh, They'll engage them to a certain extent and there'll be a bit of flirtatious exchange. But then I'm told that very often the men don't make any clear moves one way or another. And the women are kind of left in this lukewarm place of saying, is this going anywhere or not? I might expand on that, but sort of thinking, you know, how can Catholic men learn to be more decisive, whether it be fear of rejection or they're up against or fear of settling or making a decision? Uh, I think very, it's just, it's a, I think it's a, it's a problem of today, really, that men are, are just so indecisive. Do you find that yourself or? I mean, I see it in myself as well. Like, I don't, I don't find it easy to pursue i mean i'm not pursuing girls thanks be to god i'm (laughs) i'm I'm happily married with our lord like um for 14 years now and uh a shout out to to celibacy because it's like there's a massive power that you you receive we don't suppress our sexuality we don't suppress and just every day get up and say like all right i'm not gonna fall i'm not gonna look at girls it's like it's it's channeled into a force where we're we're loving only god and then that goes out to men so like yeah it's it's amazing but i mean i find it hard myself like pursuing um making a decision like we have naturally fear in us and we wake up every morning we're all afraid like there's there's things that we don't want to do there's we'd rather just do like the more comfortable option it's like a law of gravity within us that is just always tending towards the easier instead of the harder every single one of us has that uh we tend towards the bad like that's it every day everybody has that law of spiritual gravity with them so like the lads that don't pursue girls like i would say that that's a huge symptom of other problems like you'd have to go to the root yeah Um, i don't i don't want to generalize either like i know i have i've heard the same thing that you just said i have heard it especially here in ireland like where it seems like the proportion of good catholic girls and good catholic guys is like unproportionately like you know like i guess like seven girls to one guy or something like that but like if you got to the root of the problem i would wouldn't be surprised if these boys um at the end of the day did not have a serious prayer life 
if if we go back what we've been repeating this whole thing if you have a serious prayer life and god is in the center and you are not in the center when you're in the mm. center and you're taking care of yourself and you're number one you're looking after yourself how the heck are you going to do something difficult you don't want that like i said you're tending towards what's easier it's not going to happen when you have a revolution and god becomes the center you get up and it's different you say look I'm going to take up my cross and I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to follow Christ who I'm madly in love with and who I speak to. And I can hear him in prayer. And he's a real person for me. He's not an idea. This is a reality. And like, and he's inspiring me. He's telling me to do things like to go here or to talk to this person. It's like, you've developed a relationship with Christ and it's a game changer. Yeah. So like we could abstractly talk about like problems and like issues and circumstances, but like if at the end of the day, this is not a reality in this person, I find it very hard to start because like once he is in the center and once virtue comes in there, like we were talking about virtue uh, in that scene, when the woman touches the cloak of Jesus, it says in the original that virtue left from him. Mm. So contact with Christ is pulling virtue out of Christ. So like don't separate virtue and Christ because Christ mm. shows men how to be men. And it's, it's, it's precisely in contact with him where strength and virtue comes out of him into you and you become a decision maker, you become a man, you become a hard worker mm. and issues that are issues now are like, like laughable. They're not even issues. Cause like, if you were to talk about this in the fifties, like boys were getting married, you know, like at 18, 19, starting a family, getting the job, mm. they were responsible. Their parents would have suffered to like put bread on the table. It's just like this mentality of like, I am not, in, I'm not in the center. So like, <clears throat> how the heck am I going to, you know, like, it's, you don't even have that. So like the snowflake generation is like the generation that just doesn't know what the word no is. They are the most beautiful. They are perfect. They are the center of everything. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's a big problem. So like, mm -hmm. I think the center of this is, first of all, we need a Christ revolution. He needs to come back into the center of their lives. And then from their decisions, um, they start becoming made because like you're starting a life of virtue, which just basically means, you know, mm. you're saying no, when you need to say no, and you're striving to do what's difficult. And when a girl comes across your path, um, you're not like saying like, well, look, yeah, this is great for a couple of weeks. And I know <clears throat> myself, cause as this happens, you're with a girl for give or take a year or two, whatever, mm -hmm. slowly the filters start falling off and she doesn't look the same. She looked two months ago, two years ago, fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other girl looks better than she does. Fact. That's a fact. Get over it. Like you're going to be with a girl who's not going to look as attractive as the other one after a period of years. This is just the way it happens. It's like my dad, he told me when he found out I was being a priest, he's like, look, you have from now on say no to every single girl. I have to say no to every single girl, except for one, your mother. And I know my dad, like, it's like, there's going to be a point where it's like, mom, probably you isn't as attractive as this 20 year old secretary. Okay. Like, well, look, just get over it. But like the fact that we are pursuing her and I have a different mentality now because I'm living a life of prayer, life of Christ, different criteria that doesn't become a huge issue. But if I'm living for myself, that is everything. Because why? Mm. Because I want appearance. I want beauty because that's what I want. And that's what I like. And when I get annoyed or when I get tired of her, I want to move on and I will. And society encourages it. I can do it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not something that we're going to change in people because sin is what it is. And we're, we have a fallen nature. And so we're always going to be tending towards this. That's why Christ came and he supernaturalized our nature. Like we have a supernatural life within us. And what was impossible before has now become possible. And through virtue and the life of Christ in you, it becomes uh, like easy as well. Like it can become, it can become easy over time. Mm. I've, I've been celibate for 15 years. Like if you were to ask me when I was 18 years old, that I would be living without, um, you know, relationships, which is the question the boys ask us every day. How is that possible? I would have thought like them. I would have thought, well, look, that isn't possible for a man. You know, it's not. But 15, like, like 15 years, and it has to be said, like with Christ in your life and a real relationship with him, it's not only like, is it possible? It's not even like an issue. And it's a very powerful like relationship and uh, strength that you get from him. Like I said, it, it just, he emanates spiritual life. We have to be connected to him. We have to know him. Wow. Yeah, I really like that when you were saying about um, 
this sort of call to fatherhood, you know, like if you if you have to resist every single woman in the world or say no to them, uh, and then your father had to resist every single woman except for his wife. Uh, this it, sort of it's this very similar calling, you know. Um, and I loved what you were talking about with regards to discernment as well. It reminded me of Saint Augustine, you know, love God and do as you please. Sort of uh, if we if we are close enough to God and and so that we we unite our will with His, um, then will want to do the right thing uh in a sense in some way anyway uh obviously god leaves a lot of little decisions to us in our everyday lives but with big things i think uh that's that really has been helpful in my life anyway if i'm if i take things to prayer if i really say look god what you want let it be done and then if you choose to reveal the reason to me later go for it you know but uh uh whatever whatever that is um do we have any role models then? Because we're talking about fatherhood, this universal call to fatherhood for men. Uh, do we have any role models we can look up, look up to, either saints or people in the world even? Yeah, I love, I think the, I think the community of saints is a big ball that we've dropped, um, like a yeah. personal also like relationship with, I mean, don't just think saints. Like I think people, what we need to do is we need to pick one right now, like people who are listening or whatnot, like find one and read their biography don't just have the holy yeah. card or the devotion like we <laughs> need we need to delve delve into yeah. their lives because it's unreal the power of the life of a saint i'm with um yes. father willie doyle right now i'm getting into his his story and he's really helping me and uh sister claire crockett she's not canonized but uh she's also mm. I'm, I'm i'm planning on hopefully to read her book again um it helped me the first time around reading it because you're reading like this this person is like you like in all mm. these aspects and in 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 one way or another like she or he opened themselves up to god and god came in and started working together and when you read this and you live this it's like it's mm. extremely beneficial and helpful like so stop stop looking for them where they're not to be found. Yeah. A lot of times we have the tendency to do that. Like the church is so beautiful in her wisdom and her motherliness and like divine, like God did, he did, he does things perfectly. Like he gave us a mother church. She produces these saints and then she canonizes them. She puts them in front of us and she says, read their life or watch a video on them. If you can't read and like mm -hmm. start like getting into this person, because this person is going to not only transform you by their example, but they're living. Like we have a communion of saints. You can like a prayer to the saints, like talking to the saints is a reality as well. Like we live in, uh, I mean, the spiritual world, they, they say it's just like this world is like a grain of sand in comparison to the spiritual world. This is like a whole nother universe. We have to tap into that. We're so superficial. It's disgusting. Like we're so yeah. I'm talking for myself. Like, you know, it's like, lads, like if if we had just a bit of faith and we were to like look a bit above what we're in right now in this world, like as if this was everything, we're just closed mm -hmm. in and my addictions, like my problems are like it's so hard. You just like poke a little hole in the skylight and you just see like what this spiritual reality is and what's waiting for us and like how it's can you can contact them, you can speak to them. It's not like a it's not like a weird thing that Catholics believe. It's a reality. Sort of so isolated we, system. <laughs> we have to tap into the communion of saints. It has to happen. Like it's a I'm a huge promoter of, of the saints. And I'm speaking to mm -hmm. myself as well. Like I need to be more. Um the, the books I've read, like Saint Among Savages is one of the best ones I've read. If you mm -hmm. get through the first 70 pages. All right, I'll forgive you that because it's a bit more historical, but it's the life of St. Isaac Jogues. He went over to North America and he evangelized the uh, the Indians, the savages. I mean, I'll say it because like they were, they were eating each other. Like they bit off your man's fingers. Like he's a, he's a saint that went over there and he lived with them and evangelized them. And it's, uh, he's a Jesuit. So the Jesuits would write down everything. And that was put into a book form and it reads really well. I think it's uh, wow. Tal Talbot's the author, Saint Among Savages. Totally recommend that book for the lads. Wow, so, Saint Among Savages. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Yeah, it's it's really good. good. Amazing. Well, look, I mean, I think we're pretty much out of time, to be honest. Do you have any final words? Maybe something that you could say about why a man should desire to be virtuous rather than just rolling over and giving in to his animalistic impulses? Well, I mean, you guys, you know yourselves, you know what it feels like afterwards, you know, you're not meant for that. You're meant for something way greater. You have a little bit of eternity in you. You're hardwired for it. And 
thanks be to God, he came for the scumbags and the sinners and the prostitutes and the porn addicts, the drug and gambling addicts, the worst of the worst, the dregs, he drank them and he came down for that. Like That's why he came. And there is no sin that you can commit that he's not there to forgive. The only sin is thinking that he can't forgive you. That's blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That's saying Jesus' name in vain, Jesus, which means Savior, Jesus, not even you can save me. Turn to Christ. Let him into your life. He's the stronger man. He breaks in and he beats up the person that's owning you with his chains, the devil. He's the stronger man. He kicks him out. He comes in. It's a game changer and he's waiting for you. It's just a confession away, really. It's totally worth it. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much for joining us today, Father. It was an awesome show. I mean, you gave some really inspiring and insightful insights. Um, um and if you like this episode listen to our podcast go to google type in pure and heart show radio maria it'll be the first result and uh enjoy all of our awesome content there so we're going to finish up with a song now nothing to fear porter's gate featuring audrey Assad. see you next time Ooh.